I think we, we gotta be very clear about the issue of the climate change debate and the climate change conjecture. I think when we say that there is some very real issues taking place with a changing climate globally, I think we can feel it. We do have very different climate um, or seasonal changes in our, in our environment. For example, you can have, you know, in, in Cape Town, which is normally a, a, at this point in time, it will be cold, etc. It's abnormally hot right now. Uh, in Durban, which is supposed to be much more moderate and essentially weather like Rio, is getting colder. So we can see these visibilities and whether or not it's about speculation of how, uh, how much the earth becomes hotter, et cetera, I think you can see within the environment that there are significant changes to what's happening within the climate debate and within the context of it. On the context of markets, I think you, you, you have markets which are then s speculative based on how you perceive certain issues in markets. How do you actually look at markets and you say, well, if I invest in here and I speculate on there, these are the projections you get, you get back. I think in the context of the climate debate is that you can't really speculate on it because we all are going to actually end up in a situation where it's a zero sum game. In terms of, it's not negotiable, we have to do something about what's going on with our, with our, with our earth. So I think we, we've got to be careful in terms of trying to look at the two. But what I find really interesting in terms of how do we actually address the issue of the climate change debate, et cetera, is how do we actually make allowances within that debate through carbon credits? And how do we actually use carbon credits to try and offset how do we go about uh, readdressing the issue of, well, if we buy carbon credits here, we can do something there. But that's a, I mean, that's a separate debate that I think is, is, is something that we have to be careful of in assuming that this is what BRICS is gonna do in terms of changing that debate. What I'm thinking about more, more, more seriously is what is it that we want BRICS to do around su uh, sustainable development and Rio plus 20 in June? What is it that they will want to do and what is it that they can do? And I think it's important for us to be realistic about that debate as opposed to saying this is what they should be doing. These are all of the things on the agenda. And it's a bit overwhelming if I'm a BRIC country and I sit there and I look at this and I think this is, this is, this, this, and where do I start? I think that's the first point. The second point is I think we all know what the prognosis is of the future. You know, we know what the diagnosis is, we know what the prognosis is, and we're all in a bit of a, 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 a quandary that we have, to, we have to do something about it. The question is how and what? We're talking about new concepts, we're talking about frameworks, we're talking about principles, we're talking about changing mindsets, etc. The question is where do you begin? Where do you start with that process and how do you arrive at that? And I think the third issue is to, to what extent are we going to be realistic about uh, a debate which you know, is there, it's, it's, it's like the elephant in the room where you look at the, the question of saying, of, 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 of saying, well, you had the developed countries that had three years of, 300 years of development, who in a sense really are the ones that caused this whole question around, you know, in, uh, unsustainable development, et cetera. You've got the developing world that's coming up and it's 30 years of development and we also still want to develop, which is part and parcel of why it was so interesting last year at COP17, where you had these debates about what was the resolution, what was the declaration that comes out. And I think those are some of the political debates around sustainable development, which we have to think about as well. Um, and, and I think somebody said in the earlier session that they don't see anything, anything tangible coming out of Rio plus 20 uh, in, the, in, in one of the morning, se in the morning session, um, and that it'll just end up not producing something and there'll be a whole lot of like toing and froing, et cetera, around who actually gets what they want out of this thing. And I think it's going to be about political compromises at the end of the day. Yeah, uh, I say a few words about uh, that question. Where to start? Yeah. Yes, that's, that's a good question. Uh, Dr. Mihailov wanted to jump in. Let's let him. Um, I, I wanted to uh, suggest one thing regarding the input uh, Russia can probably provide because uh, I, I fully agree that we are um, 
we are so diverse, we are different. Uh, we have a uh, different uh, track, in fact. Uh, and uh, I believe um, if we're talking about Russia, um, it's a unique country which uh, for the recent uh, 20 years have uh, changed uh, so dramatically it's, it's, um, it's, let's call it root, uh, from, uh, from uh, a superpower uh, with, with the uh, socialist ideas and socialist agenda, we, uh, we turned out to be uh, now a, a, a second grade, um, well, from the point of view of the developed countries, we are now the backyard and, and uh, we are now democratic. Anyway, uh, I believe that we have the unique experience in uh, being able to compare what was it like in uh, being uh, a state which uh, was uh, developing uh, a socialist agenda, uh, socially oriented, uh, and uh, what we have now. We can easily see the consequences, although there is an endless debate about uh, whether we have enough billionaires and uh, enough poor people. I wanted to give you uh, a, a fascinating example. Uh, what happened in uh, Russia uh, is, is really um, uh, a dramatic thing. Um, there were two, uh, two uh, figures. Uh, they're coming from United Nations report on, on um, on the social development in different countries, and for the Eastern Europe, uh, by Eastern Europe, uh, I mean uh, Eastern European countries, including European Russia, in um, 1986, uh, the population which lived beyond poverty line uh, amounted to 18 million. The same report, the same statistics uh, coming from UN for 1996 gave the amount of 182 million. So uh, a nice jump, right? A nice example of how the middle class of, of Eastern Europe was uh, destroyed, basically destroyed. Um, well, but my point was that <coughs> if we're talking about urban development, uh, we were always proud about uh, Moscow. At that time, I, I recall Moscow in the 70s being a city of 7 million people. Uh, we had an excellent uh, public transportation system, Moscow Metro, you probably heard about it. Uh, there were relatively few cars in the street, although the, the streets, the avenues were quite wide and there were absolutely no problem about, about public transportation and everything. Uh, and of course, the pollution issues were not on the agenda. What we have now, uh, after we finally got to the democratic world, we have cars, uh, but we go nowhere because we're stuck uh, all the time, you know, and we are breathing these uh, CO2, these uh, nice uh, atmosphere we have these days, and uh, why don't we, why don't we study a little bit? Why don't we, uh, I, I believe this exp just our experience can give you some some uh, good examples, uh, and you would not be able to repeat our our mistakes because it's very easy to to project. You know. 
Dr. Fang wanted yeah, to Yeah, could you, uh, I would like to answer your question. Where to start? Yeah, so uh, in China, first we must educate and train the leaders, national leaders, provincial leaders, and the municipal leaders. So that's why we built our academy, our school. So every year in China, the ministers, provincial governors, mayors, ambassadors, even the university presidents must be received, you know, they are required to attend the training programs. So they must to be trained from one week to one month or even two months every year. So they must learn the new ideas, new knowledge, and the new the practices at home and abroad. So for example, the green economy, substantial development, and any other new ideas. So they must learn. So that's our responsibility. We must train the new leaders with a new mindset, with the new capability and ability to build a new world. So I think this is very useful and a feasible means for the future development. Thank you, Dr. Fang. I think at this point we can see if there are any questions from the audience through our panel. Yes, back there. I have two different uh, questions about uh, cooperation among the BRICS. One in the big scenario um, uh, of the Rio plus 20 is that so far we don't have a common um, agreement among the BRICS. Uh, it's so far it's very obvious. And um, is that uh, when Sanushka asked about um, are we cooperating the same, are we doing the same thing in north, south, or in the mean that um, um, that we are waiting for, uh, and uh, I would like to make a bridge of what Paulo said about the Kunkas uh, research of uh, how the BRICS have de uh, developed the different things. Uh, uh, acted differently like on the Washington consensus and so on. Here, are we waiting for um, American response to say no? Or are we trying to build our own idea of, oh, we want this, or are we just waiting for, uh, like in the Washington consensus where we said, no, this I cannot apply, that I cannot apply. So in my uh, research and what I've been reading about is that we have nothing uh, to guide us. So we are waiting for outside response. And we are following on the uh, ideas of the skepticism of the realist perspective that we, when we, we have uh, different interests, we don't cooperate. So that's what I think. Thank you. You can do it in Portuguese, of course. Yes, then I'm going to do it in Portuguese. A Sanusha falou sobre o surgimento de os BRICS estimulando uma espécie de surgimento de constelações, de agrupamentos, mas eu acho que esse surgimento de, de constelações, de agrupamentos, mostra, sim, uma certa relevância dos BRICS, de uma forma, assim, uma espécie de estímulo é, para essa formação, essa gênese de outras formações, possibilitando que outros países possam se posicionar em diferentes esferas, regionais ou de forma global, como os BRICS pretendem. É, em relação às agendas dos BRICS, as exigências, e as exigências serem extensas, é, acho que ninguém falou que essa, essa agenda, essas exigências, têm que estar concentradas no Estado. E o que a gente pode observar aqui com o seminário é, e com o BRICS para esses centros, de, de uma maneira, no caso do Brasil, 
é que existe uma pressão e uma articulação da, da sociedade civil que pode incorporar essa agenda extensa e desafogar as exigências do, do Estado ou do corpo governamental oficial. E isso, de uma maneira, é, suaviza o, o papel do Estado e elimina certas responsabilidades que os BRICS não, não estão prontos para lidar na esfera oficial governamental. E aí volta o que o, o representante Russo falou no começo, uma espécie de Wise Man Club. E, e quem, então, pode desafogar essa, essa agenda das mãos do Estado e, e como se forma isso? Então, nesse primeiro momento, num, é, a crítica à agenda ela tem que vir imaginar essa agenda concentrada em mãos oficiais, em mãos governamentais. E se a gente puder observar aqui, que tipo de pressão e como é, é, a influência pode, ser, pode vir do, do meio acadêmico e dos pensadores, e não só dos representantes políticos. Então, essa seria a minha pergunta. É, como isso poderia acontecer? E, brevemente, uma outra em relação ao, ao conceito de desenvolvimento, se a gente tem o desenvolvimento como uma prática e como a lente com qual os países emergentes passaram a se enxergar também. Uma prática que vem de fora, a prática do desenvolvimento, mas é, é, nós começamos a, a, a nos olhar com essas mesmas lentes, sendo que foram coisas que vieram de fora e, e essa própria tendência do desenvolvimento, ela primeiramente é, forma as anomalias, ela aponta as coisas que estão erradas, o, o desnutrido, o, o pobre, é, e ela, a nossa parte de desenvolvimento começa a, a ver o que está errado e, e a estimular a correção desses erros ou, ou dessas anomalias. Mas, é, então, se estimula esse desenvolvimento e agora percebe-se que esse desenvolvimento leva ao consumo e, e a Sérgio também falou da, dos indigenous knowledges. Então, é, agora está no momento onde, onde retorna e fala, ah, não, não, Vamos voltar e vocês não deveriam consumir tanto, deveríamos agora é, revalorizar esses, esses conhecimentos originários. Então, percebemos que foi um erro estimular e tirar é, é, essa, essa formação e essa, esse andamento desses, desses indigenous knowledges e agora quer se retornar para isso. Eu queria ouvir de vocês é, o que, que vocês acham dessa contradição. Obrigado. Mais alguma pergunta? Uh, ok, mais duas e a gente encerra essa rodada. Breves, por favor. É, vocês falaram, é, em geral, que os países BRICS concordam que, é, especialmente os Estados, né, que não é possível nem desejável repetir o modelo americano né, de crescimento, tanto no plano do governo quanto no plano da sociedade. E a pergunta seria em relação às corporações, que eu acho que é um agente, são um agente importante do processo BRICS. É, os BRICS têm uma relação diferente com as corporações, capazes de modificar, por exemplo, os efeitos indesejáveis do que vocês chamaram de americanização. Existe uma alternativa para o Estado e o mercado nos BRICS se articularem de uma forma economicamente sustentável? Obrigado. Bom, é, pelo que eu percebi, não há uma agenda comum dos BRICS, então, para Rio Mais 20. É, inclusive, a Sanusha enfatizou bastante que nós deveríamos pensar em outras questões, em outros temas, que, de repente, os BRICS não seriam uma fonte interessante para a unicidade em termos de se pensar o desenvolvimento sustentável. É, eu queria só colocar a seguinte questão. Para se pensar em desenvolvimento sustentável, nós devemos pensar do porquê que, hoje em dia, o nosso desenvolvimento é insustentável, não se sustenta. Pensando sobre isso, nós chegamos a um ponto que pode unir os BRICS, que são os níveis de consumo nos países desenvolvidos, que causam problemas que hoje em dia nós tratamos como causa, mas que na verdade são sintomas desses níveis, como a emissão de poluentes na atmosfera. E aí o exemplo que o Mikhailov deu aqui é interessante a respeito disso, como se pensar numa economia que seja uma economia sustentável, se nós temos as ruas entupidas de carro, queimando combustível e poluindo a atmosfera com CO2, sem falar em toda a ênfase dada na indústria do carbono por conta disso. Então, se nós começarmos a pensar na lógica dos países BRICS, enfatizando o aspecto 
do consumo exagerado dos países envolvidos, que causam o um problema da insustentabilidade, de repente, aí nós podemos trazer o debate novamente para discutir desenvolvimento sustentável a partir da dimensão econômica, social e ambiental. Eu gostaria de ouvir reações da mesa em relação a isso. 